Uh, Hi, everyone. Welcome to Grand Rounds. It's beautiful out there today, but I just saw that it seems like it's going to rain both days this weekend, but still a little too early to tell, I'd say. Look, my uh, circle's a little off center there. This is today's CME code, Meg Juz. Okay, we, I think we got a couple of all stars. Uh, first is Dr. Jordan Larson, who uh, inspires Tasmin to be a better uh, doctor every day. And uh, yesterday at Morning Report, she admitted what seemed like 13 patients and did a fabulous job. So we all agree with the Tasmin's uh, sentiment. And Sina, one of our critical care doctors, knowledgeable, kind, forgiving. Interesting. What do you think he forgave? <laughs> and helpful. Anyway, congrats, Sina. Uh, the research roundup, Ornit and Mike Lutz wrote a position paper. Did I see Ornit here? No, I, I guess. Okay, maybe that's where I saw her. Wrote a position paper on disease candidate genes, which are short structural variants to guide. We're already in a post GWAS world, Mike. Uh, late onset Alzheimer's uh, disease and Alzheimer's and dementia, of which Mike, that's probably now the, the, the journal of the field and Mike is one of the editors on it, so good for him. And Yang Chen and Fabiana Diaz, as well as other members of Yang's lab, identified a, a TRIPV4 expressing a trigeminal ganglion neurons as a potential target for TMJ. Uh, July 11th is the upcoming Comprehensive Epilepsy Center Symposium. So all of you interested, write it down. The, the uh, guest speaker is Cameron McIntyre, who's also doing grand rounds here in the next several weeks. Oh, I like their little symbol. Uh, July 1, it's a big day in medical fields. As you all know, it's new resident day. Is it actually July 1 or is it a different day? When I was, it was July, it's today, okay. Are there new people here? Oh, one, welcome. You haven't seen the show before, but this is how we do Grand Rounds. Uh, it's also a Dominion Day in Canada where Canada got autonomous status from the British Crown, now known as Canada Day. Nobody knows this, but this was also, nobody knows what I'm talking about. This was the day in 1979, Sony introduced the Walkman, was the, which was the first, kind of cool thing, but in retrospect, it was decidedly uncool, but it seemed cool at the time. Marlon Brando died in 2004. You probably don't even know who he is as well. In 2013, our neurology department was born on July 1. Joel was the chair. And this July 1, the, the Duke Health Integrated Practice is born in the PDC, which I know you wonder why such a strange name is PDC, but just think about it for a bit. Uh, completely goes away. Ah, oh, look at that, something happened here. Uh, anyway, we have a special faculty meeting tonight at 5.30 to talk about alignment finances. The end of the year holiday party, the, the house staff is invited is August 7th. Then we got the bulls, which I think is September one. And what's the other thing? Yes, the resident welcome. What day is that? July 13th, thank you, at Duke Gardens. That's where I hand out new pins to all the young folks. So I'm still looking for grand round speakers. Suma sent me some names, but please send me names, internal or external to NeuroChair. That's my secret email that I actually look at, or to send them to Tico. Okay, for all the faculty out there, Joel brought this up. You've got to get on Duke at work and change your retirement contributions because all that's going to be there on July 1st is your prior School of Medicine ones, okay? So you go to my benefits, you click on enroll and make changes in my 403B, okay? You'll go there and you hit the little pencil over there, which means edit, don't hit the trash. And if you hit the pencil, this will pop up and I put in, let's say 2000, which is my current monthly contribution. If you check the box, max contribution, it'll pop a number up there, which will tell you your legally allowed maximum contribution. And then you can either decide that that's fine or you can back it down a little bit. And then you have to click save 
and then you're all set. And this max contribution pulls in what your new salary in DHIP will be. And so it adjusts everything and you'll be fine. So like a month ago, I saved you from dying with no life insurance. And now we're going to make sure that you have a nice retirement. For some reason, that email they sent us said you have to do it this week. Yeah, so I mean, what you should. Sure. Yeah, just like the life insurance, you gotta do it. Okay, what does Prachi love about uh, patients with epilepsy? And she said, growth. Uh, the doctors have a chance to grow and learn from every patient, uh, every success and failure. And I knew when I came here and I was told to have three values, one of my values was learning, which I think is the same as Prachi's uh, concept of growth. Again, this is today's CME code. And we're really fortunate to have Mike Lutz come give a little talk about the statistics of lecanemab. Mike's an associate professor, but not for long. Uh, Mike's an amazing pe uh, person, if you know his, his background. I think he majored in uh, botany and then taught himself to be a statistician and uh, is now one of the gr great statisticians of the world and certainly an enormous uh, help to our department. And as I mentioned before, an enormously important researcher as well. So Mike, Take it away. What did you major in? Biomedical engineering. It's like botany. <laughs> sort of, sort of. Okay, do I? Botany for mathematicians. So where is yours? Is it open? Did you put her like that? A couple of two old men up here trying to figure out how this works. All right, now, now we go, they're hiding. Okay, here's Zoom. What did you zoom? Slide shot of? Yeah, we want a Zoom meeting and we want to do share screen, but I hit it. So I have to hit S. Is at the bottom maybe? Share screen's down there. <laughs> there we go. But then you want to do- um, We can make it big, we can make it big. So we're sharing this now. Yeah. And then I want to hide your meeting controls. See, the entire internet hears us feebly trying to figure this out. Okay. And then I think you just take it away, do whatever you want. So if you hit the. Yeah, don't I want to go to slideshow though? To... Yeah, right here. Okay. There you go. Oh, there you go. Great. Thank you, Rich. Good morning, everyone. That was a fantastic introduction. So this case study looks at two aspects of clinical trials, assessment of statistical significance and definitions of clinical meaningfulness. And how can I advance? Okay. The, uh, the recent approvals of aducanumab and lecanemab set off a flurry of uh, headlines in the popular press and in the scientific literature. In the popular press, terms like wonder drug and uh, breakthrough appeared often. The coverage in the scientific literature was all over the map from questions on statistical analysis, safety versus efficacy profiles, and assessment of the strengths of the evidence. These are the top line results from the lecanemab primary study. The top panel was CDR, sum of boxes. CDR is a clinical dementia rating scale. It's a real world measure of cognitive and functional performance for Alzheimer's disease and related dementias. Panel B, just below the uh, large top panel, uh, is amyloid burden on PET. The remaining panels show other cognitive measures. The amyloid results don't require much in the way of statistics for interpretation. There's a sustained and dramatic decrease in amyloid. The canary in the coal mine, though, uh, are the y-axis scales. The study was well-powered, and there was a statistically significant effect observed at the 18-month time point. However, whether the effect size was meaningful was questioned. Correct, the cognitive outcome, uh, which is, yeah, the large top boxes, CDR sum of boxes, clinical dementia rating scale. The um, difference between treatment and placebo groups for CDR sum of boxes at 18 months is just 0.45, and the score ranges from zero to 18. I've been working with a group of biostatisticians to investigate whether Bayesian analysis can provide additional information uh, on the interpretation of clinical trials and examine some of the confounding questions around the trial results, such as subgroup analysis, dosage, and effect sizes. Since we don't have the actual individual level trial data yet, we have to design simulations of the trials based on the published data. 
uh, and the papers. So we've now simulated seven studies, including aducanumab and lecanemab. Bayesian analysis is an approach to statistical analysis where you update probabilities for testing hypotheses as more data becomes available. For the clinical trials, that frames up the hypothesis testing beyond just testing a null hypothesis of no difference between placebo and treatment groups. Keep in mind that the statistical model that's associated with the hypothesis tests, so either the numerator or the denominator in this uh, sort of simplified slide, um, it can be complex. It'll include the treatment effect and various covariates and confounders. And actually in evasion format, these are, these are marginal probabilities. But what we did was use this Bayesian analysis approach to test different assumptions and findings from the clinical trials. This slide shows the Bayesian analysis uh, for several aspects of the Acanumab trial. The two panels address questions about treatment effect sizes. Biogen made many points about running subgroup analysis where they excluded rapid progressors. What the panel on the left shows is that the distribution of effect sizes is not much different whether or not you include rapid progressors. So you can see those are almost uh, congruent uh, plots. Um, the traditional analysis that they did showed this as a significant effect, but it focused on the p-value rather than the size of the effect. The panel on the right paints the same picture of the effect size plotted by treatment arm, low dose, high dose, and placebo. The change in CDR sum of boxes varied similarly across all three groups. In retrospect, looking at several studies, the lecanemab effect is about the same size as aducanumab with a moderate support for the drug effect, albeit small when you look across seven different studies. And you can see how the Bayesian uh, analysis helps uh, improve that um, estimate of reliability of the effect size. When all was said and done, whether you looked at Bayesian analysis or classical hypothesis testing, you came away with the conclusion that the drug greatly reduced amyloid and over time slowed the progression of the CDR sum of boxes relative to control. Then the question arises of whether the drug has a clinically meaningful impact on patients and how you define that term. Several groups started to address this question, including a group that the Alzheimer's Association convened. And this is the crux of their argument. A patient treated with lecanemab would be at about the same point at 36 months that they would be at 24 months without treatment. And there are obviously tons of caveats. Is the estimated rate of slowing consistent and constant over time? Is the rate of slowing linear? Um, how variable are the patients? But this plot does make a really good point that in a clinical trial where you're maybe 18 months in duration, you're only seeing uh, a very short length of time for the, uh, for the actual uh, effect of the drug. On this slide, I captured a few uh, comments and observations from papers on clin clinical meaningfulness and commentary on the papers. So you can get some idea of uh, what patients and caregivers consider meaningful. Uh, the comment there from Oscar Hansen from patients 25 to 35% slowing of clinical progression is meaningful. I thought that was sort of an interesting comment. So in summary, here are a few major points. I didn't have a chance to cover the Bayesian analysis of the phase 2b dose study uh, in detail, but it's an interesting application where the Bayesian analysis was actually part of the study designed uh, to determine the ED90. Um, and I'm currently working uh, on a special issue of Alzheimer's and Dementia Journal on Bayesian analysis of clinical trials. So uh, if you've got interest in, in uh, participating in that, let me know. And finally, just to remind you that I am available for statistical consulting on projects in neurology and would welcome discussion about any of the material I covered today. Thank you. You want to get yours ready? Sure. Right. So, um, so now it's my pleasure to introduce our last chief grand round speaker of the year. Um, so, uh, Dylan Ryan, who agreed to give this talk on his very last week of residency. Um, so uh, that's always a hard spot to fill as residents are leaving you know, off to set up fellowships and uh, go on to the next stage. So um, Dylan, who uh, everyone in the room, I think, has had the opportunity to work with at some point, um, as many people know, uh, did his undergrad at Duke, did his medical school at the University of Kentucky before coming back this way. Um, he's been a, a resident who um, 
scares me every time he asks a question or if I have to uh, try and contradict him because he's probably right. Um, I have it on good authority. He might be a Boston sports fan. <laughs> and we're very fortunate that he's sticking around for fellowship and hopefully beyond that. So today he's going to be speaking to us about endovascular treatments and uh, thrombectomy. I'll try and talk into the mic, Rich, um, and not mumble like Bill Belichick up here. Thank you, Dr. Eckstein, for the very generous introduction. Um, I will try and ask more questions as they come up. Um, but uh, yes, um, you heard about me becoming like a, a trader in medical school and working my way back to Duke. And I am indeed a, a Boston sports fan, as you can see, kind of by these uh, colors, which I gave my first talk of the year in our residency noon conference series with this kind of same colored backdrop. So I figured it was right to finish up that way. Um, so as Dr. Eckstein said, my name is Dylan Ryan, my government name, I guess. Uh, it is Dylan as the first name, uh, but I go by Rhino as well. And I'm happy to be called by that. And I'm gonna be talking today about endovascular thrombectomy in patients with pre-stroke disability. Let's see. I have no disclosures whatsoever. And there is a uh, prize, considering this is my retirement from residency talk. Um, if somebody could text me, get one guest, text or put it in the chat, the one sports retirement uh, that made me cry or tear up, not ball, but tear up, um, you, you can win a prize. So uh, it's a secret. Uh, it, it may be Boston related. We'll see. Um, it's, it's universal, though. It'll be nice. Um, there is a couple interactive sections as well. Um, so if you have poll everywhere, hopefully it will work. Uh, that's the code or text to join, um, which I'll leave up here as I'm talking. Again, it's Dylan Ryan, not Ryan Dylan, with the numbers 923. It'll be at the top as well. So we'll start there. Um, so this is a 73-year-old woman with a history of hypertension, hyperlipidemia, osteoarthritis, and reported dementia, who's on Aricept, who presented the last known well at, say, last night of 7 p.m. Uh, with fluent aphasia and right-sided weakness. She lives with her son and is able to get herself dressed and bathe herself, but no longer manages her finances or drives. She's interactive with neighbors and enjoys going out to play bingo. She uses a cane to ambulate. Her night stroke scale is 14 when she comes in. Her aspect score is nine. She doesn't have a bleed. She has a distal left M1 occlusion, and she has a large mismatch on her perfusion scan. The question is, should this person go for thrombectomy? Hopefully this works. If not, just let me know. Is it not working? Ah, okay. My bad. Well, we can skip. We'll do the last one. It's more interesting anyway. Um, so the second case is basically the same patient, except now, she is in a wheelchair because she has horrible osteoarthritis of her hips. Her night stroke scale is 18. She has that same distal left M1 occlusion. She's aphasic and her perfusion scan is a large mismatch. Should she be taken for thrombectomy? Maybe it's not working. I activated this on my computer, so. Apologies. We could raise hands if we want. Uh, it, it doesn't matter. <laughs> it should. I activated it on my computer. I can't do it from my phone. My computer's open. I don't know why it's not working. It doesn't really matter in the grand scheme of things. But um, the objectives of this talk beyond kind of, that was more of an exercise to see where people were before we talked about this, were to review kind of what we're talking about when we talk about stroke disability and pre-stroke disability, which is kind of reviewing the utility of what we call the modified Rankin scale, as well as the guidelines of the current guidelines for endovascular thrombectomy and acute ischemic stroke, and then reviewing the current evidence for use of this procedure in patients with pre-stroke disability and what that exactly means. So I think every neurology resident in the room has probably seen this diagram before, and it's a 
graphical representation or an artistic representation of the modified Rankine scale. And what that really is, it was a, developed in the 1950s by a guy named Dr. John Rankin, who was looking to create a more holistic approach uh, to defining disability in this population. So he created this scale from one to five, which is relatively simple to use, or it's not a, a, a grand scale in the terms of things like disability um, at that point. This was later further modified, hence the modified Rankin scale in the 1980s during the UK TIA trial, which was a trial that helped uh, grow our evidence for use of aspirin in patients with TIA and stroke uh, to add a MRS of zero for patients without symptoms. Let me see if I have my mouse. And then later expanded to include an MRS of six, which is death. So those two ends of the spectrum are pretty easy to understand. If you have an MRS of zero, you have no symptoms whatsoever, no degree of disability. MRS of six is death. Patients with an MRS of one have what's called non-significant disability. Essentially, they may have symptoms, but no impact on their day-to-day -day life or their ability to perform their ADLs. MRS of two are people who are functionally um, disabled or slightly disabled. They essentially have symptoms that mean they can't do everything that they once did, but they have no problems performing their kind of daily living activities or their um, the kind of important functions of their life. Patients with a MRS of three are labeled as moderately disabled. Um, so they can walk without assistance essentially, but need help um, with some of these day-to-day -day functions. Patients with MRS of four cannot walk without assistance and need help with day-to-day -day functions. Patients with an MRS of five are essentially bed bound, okay? And when they first did this in the 1980s, as part of this study, they essentially looked at, uh, wanted to look at the intra-observer reliability of um, two different observers kind of uh, being able to uh, produce or label what somebody's modified rank and scale was or their degree of disability. So this is a little bit confusing of a figure. So at the top is the first observer and on this column is the second observer. And they're basically putting the proportion of the, or the number of patients where observer one, say, gave the patient an MRS of zero and observer two gave the patient an MRS of zero. So this was done on a hundred patients with two separate structured interviews from a pool of 10 neurologists and 24 residents who are trained to do this, okay? And they essentially agreed 65% of the time with this Kappa statistic, which looks at inter-observer inter -observer reliability of 0.56, essentially coming to the conclusion that this is a relatively reliable means of doing this and that two separate observers can agree a reasonable amount of time. Most of where the disagreements are kind of in the middle of the scale, which will come into why that's important eventually, um, and a difference of one or two points on the scale. Well, this was later repeated on 113 patients, again, with two separate interviews drawn from 15 providers. So this could be an attending physician, a resident, or an APP who would do this. And we got slightly different results. So they really only agreed 43% of the time, and they did so without a structured interview. So essentially, the interviewer would go in, essentially estimate or through their own process, um, come up with a number and see if it agreed with Raider 2. When they, and we'll talk about some of the structured interview um, that may help with this, but this raises some important questions in our stroke world that I'll touch upon, but we may not be as good at using this very simple scale as we feel like we are. So this is a busy figure again, but there's a bunch of studies like this where they essentially did a, a review or an analysis of them. And I won't go into everything, but as you can see, kind of within this Kappa statistic, looking at the reliability, there's a lot of variance here from as low as 0.25 um, to as high as an 80% agreement. Okay. So between two trained neurologists, and we're all trained before we come into residency, we go through a training sequence to understand what this scale means and give our best estimation of what somebody's degree of disability based on this may be. Again, we're not agreeing uh, at the rate where maybe we think we are. Now, if we use this standardized set of nine questions, uh, we're much better at uh, coming to an agreement.
Um, this is actually on MD Calc now. You can easily pull this up and ask these questions. But as Coach Joe Missoula is wondering, as he's calling a timeout, why are we really talking about this? Okay. And part of the reason is when somebody comes in as an acute stroke, they may not always talk. They don't have a family member who can answer some of these questions. You probably just based on time can't go through all these questions with them right then and there. So you're using your best tools available, someone else's history, which may be limited from an outside hospital, EMS, our own chart reviews to come up with an answer on what this number may be. And it may not always agree with somebody else. And why that becomes important is based on uh, these guidelines here, which were written in 2019 by our own Dr. Powers. And what essentially is being described, so there's two separate windows that we often talk about in thrombectomy, the zero to six hour or early window. And we'll talk about a little bit of where that comes from, as well as this delayed window from six to 24 hours. And I've tried to use these uh, dark circles uh, to bring this up, but as part of the inclusion criteria for this level of evidence of being an A, or all our trials, are looking at mainly patients who are an MRS of zero to one. So patients who are essentially walking with very minimal symptoms who have no impact, or these symptoms have no impact on their real day-to-day -day life, okay? So they're basically looking at patients like often you or I. Um, for both of these kind of early window uh, guidelines. Within the six to 24 hour guideline that there's one study, which we'll talk about, which expands this to a pre-stroke MRI from zero or pre-stroke MRS, sorry, from zero to two. But again, these are mainly patients who are functionally independent. And we'll talk about why that's important as well. I promise I'll get there um, within these trials. So let's talk a little bit about where this, kind of becomes important or why we're really focusing on thrombectomy. So this is essentially a meta-analysis called Hermes or Hermes, however you want to pronounce it, on five different kind of acute window trials within thrombectomy. So things like Mr. Clean or Swift Prime that a lot of residents have heard about, which are mainly patients within a zero to 12 hour window, often zero to six hours, looking at the impact of endovascular thrombectomy as compared to standard medical therapy. So things like aspirin, statin, rehabilitation, at least in the early window. Looking at the primary outcome of a shift in the modified Rankin scale. So in a lot of stroke trials, you'll see figures like this, which display the patients themselves with the percentage of patients who fall into one of these categories of a modified Rankin scale after the intervention or at 90, essentially 90 days, okay? And you can see in this trial through the intervention of endovascular thrombectomy, and these are patients with anterior circulation strokes, so things like ICAs and M1 occlusions mainly, or even tandem occlusions, there's a very clear shift in improvement of functional outcomes or improvement to functional independence, which is defined as a modified Rankin scale of zero to two. So essentially patients who can do all their ADLs. Okay, So we have this clear shift around around 20% of these patients get back to an MRS of zero to two through this procedure at 90 days, okay? So that's a very powerful intervention for somebody who may have been completely debilitated from a stroke, who may have ended up bed bound and aphasic, who's now walking and able to potentially hold a job or interact with their family or have improved quality of life through the things that they might want to do. Okay, the number needed to treat for this intervention within this window was five. Okay, and a significant number of these patients had early recovery um, within 24 hours. So that's a decrease in the NIH stroke scale of eight points or a decrease to an NIH stroke scale of zero to one, essentially. So minimal symptoms. Hunter kind of talked about early, and I won't hamper on this, the limitations of subgroup analyses through this forest plot where you're imparting more. Uh, selection biases and biases itself from separating these groups. But you can basically see within this, every, pretty much every subgroup favors from the intervention, especially older patients, um, patients with M1 occlusions, patients with high NIH stroke scales, patients beyond you know, five hours from uh, randomization, and even patients with tandem lesions of the ICA and MCA. Okay, so very powerful tool. We then expanded this, so there's a couple of trials. The first one was DAWN, which looked at patients who are six to 24 hours from their last known well, 
who had a pre-stroke modified Rankine scale of zero to one, again, basically minimal symptoms without an impact on their day-to-day -day life in these three different groups of patients based on age, their NIH stroke scale, and the volume of their infarct based on perfusion imaging, okay? Their primary outcome was this utility-weighted modified Rankine scale. So they use certain patient characteristics and provider kind of characteristics to weight some of these outcomes. But the trial was actually stopped early because there was such a benefit of endovascular thrombectomy in this population. And you can see that in 107 patients, you have this huge sweeping benefit from going up there and taking this clot out rather than just pay putting patients on aspirin within these patients who have an MRS of zero to one. The number needed to treat for this population getting back to an MRS of zero to two is around two. So 50% of patients who fall into this inclusion criteria got back to walking with minimal symptoms without need for help doing their ADLs, which is incredibly powerful as compared to a lot of our medical interventions elsewhere in neurology. Again, looking at subgroups, Going back to kind of these groups, so patients who are greater than 80, this group A um, had clear benefit, as you can see here, patients with high NIH stroke scales or even lower patients with M1 occlusions um, had a clear benefit to doing this procedure. And it's why we hamper on this often and why we get so many calls as residents about doing these cases. There was another then trial within this delayed window called Diffuse 3, which looks six to 16 hours from last known well. This is where we get an MRS of zero to two. So they looked at patients who are functionally independent with an NIH stroke scale of greater than or equal to six, which is a whole talk for a different day um, on why I think some of that in, in the thrombectomy world is kind of silly, but uh, I won't get into it. Um, with these perfusion uh, characteristics. So essentially patients without a large core infarct defined as less than 70 cc's and a high enough penumbral volume that created a mismatch where essentially the idea is that in removing or performing this procedure, there's enough salvageable tissue to make it worthwhile and minimize your risk. And again, looking at this primary outcome of a shift in the modified Rankine scale, harping on it again, there's a clear shift from medical therapy to endovascular therapy in regard to functional independence in this population with a number needed to treat of around three. The number needed to harm in both these trials, so DAWN and Diffuse, uh, for uh, symptomatic intracranial hemorrhage is 35. So there are some risks, but minimal risk as compared to the number of patients who benefit in regard to their functional independence. And again, looking at the forest plot and subgroup analyses, you see that these patients who are older, who maybe have higher stroke scales, uh, are all favoring endovascular therapy, which is why this is a powerful intervention. But as Bobby Boucher here is raising his hand uh, in class, we can see that the issue with this is all the patients that I'm finally here talking about have been excluded from these trials. And here, especially at Duke, or more so through time, as more of these patients with chronic, chronic medical illnesses are being appropriately treated and living longer, and we're increasing and improving life expectancy in this country, the number of patients who come in with pre-stroke disability who may have large vessel occlusions is quite high and estimated to be as high as. That's, that's maybe like a side issue that would come up, not to, to derail things, but yes. It is absolutely relevant, and hence why I, uh, part of my invented case there was a patient with reported dementia who seemed to have mild symptoms of memory loss, 100%. Agreed. Um, so up to a third of patients essentially are coming in with disability who are having activations for stroke code who aren't included in these trials. And the question is really what to do with them. And some of that depends on the aggressiveness of the interventionalist or the neurologist and some of that discussion. And some of these patients may be completely excluded at different centers just based on their degree of their, their MRS. They weren't part of that trial. Their stroke scale is this. They didn't fit into this inclusion criteria and thus are maybe uh, excluded from a, a powerful intervention as we've seen that's uh, improving a number of functional outcomes uh, in patients. Our 
ability, going back to looking at our ability to agree in regard to our pre-stroke modified Rankine scale, which is a nonlinear function essentially of disability in that early window may not be as good as we think it is. If we can do a standardized questionnaire or have patients come in for a stroke follow-up clinic visit, we can take a lot of time to tease some of those things out, which may put them in a specific group. But as all the residents have probably experienced or a lot of the vascular neurologists, you have a limited, uh, you have limited information at that time, which may cause you to have to estimate, which may impact somebody's decision-making um, in regard to talking about a procedure with an interventionalist. The other issue with this, so it's easy to, it's much easier to define a good outcome in patients who come in who are walking without symptoms whatsoever. It makes sense that defining a, a, a post-stroke disability or a 90-day uh, MRS of zero to two or functional independence would be a good outcome. But for this population, we may be underselling what's an acceptable outcome or what their, uh, what they'd prefer in regard to their quality of life. Um, and that's really hard to define within the, the framework of our stroke trials, but we may be missing a number of patients who are okay with living in a certain way, as long as they're able to do certain activities. And that may be different for different people. And that's part of why it's harder to do that. Um, but I think it's important to be able to talk about that with patients. And then the other issue within this population is there's a lot of concern that maybe they don't behave exactly like somebody with an MRS of zero in regard to their mortality, their rates of symptomatic hemorrhage. Are there a lot more risk in doing a procedure on somebody who has increased frailty or other comorbid illnesses that maybe we're missing from the modified Rankin scale? Um, so these are important questions to kind of ask ourselves. And going to kind of teasing out why some of these folks may benefit. I felt this was an interesting study that was done over a five-year period, I believe in the UK, on patients with a modified Rankin scale from two to four, looking at uh, their essentially delta or their change in the modified Rankin scale after a stroke and their outcomes. So this looked at, uh, again, prospectively at 530 patients and looked at Mortality at one year, mortality at five years, looked at cost of care, the rate uh, that people, what they're talking about here with institutionalized is the, the degree of somebody being in a facility. And you can see in a significant way with each increase in point of the modified Rankin scale, there was a significant increase in one year mortality or five year mortality in these patients. More of these patients were uh, in a facility. Our care costs for these patients were increasing, meaning that the value of our care may be impacted by not being able to keep these patients essentially where they were at before. So looking at this, one may be able to hypothesize that if somebody could, arguably keep somebody at the functional degree that they're at now, say an MRS of three, and keep them there, we may lower the cost of our overall care, improve their outcomes, and lead to more acceptable outcomes for patients, keeping patients uh, alive for a longer period of time with their families. So there's been a number of observational studies that looked into this, and this is essentially a, a, a meta-analysis that looked to compare essentially on the Where's my mouse? Patients with, without pre-stroke disability to patients with pre-stroke disability, so defined as an MRS of greater than or equal to three as compared to the population of zero to two, with defining a good outcome as an MRS of zero to two or return to baseline modified Rankin scale, so where they were before. In comparing, I won't go over this whole forest plot, but essentially patients without pre-stroke disability had a higher rate of return uh, or a, a higher likelihood of a what's defined here as a good outcome and whether that it truly is a good outcome in regard to these patients with post-stroke or pre-stroke disabilities is a question, but they had slightly higher rates of return to, to their essentially baseline MRS. They had lower mortality. So this is the, the B group here is looking at mortality at 90 days as compared to patients with pre-stroke disability with similar rates of hemorrhage. So one of those hypothesized points, it seems like patients with increasing disability do have increased risk of mortality, but within this study as well, which is a, a kind of five different studies with different inclusion criteria, 
around 26% or 27% of those patients within the, the pre-stroke disability group return to their baseline pre-stroke disability, which may be quite good if you look at one in four patients, knowing that patients with pre-stroke disability may have a higher risk of mortality, but that may be due to their own comorbid illnesses or frailty outside of the modified Rankin scale. So there is at least some evidence that perhaps we can improve outcomes in some of these patients, but it's a little unclear. There was a, another study, and I should say back to this study, this lacta control arm as well. These are all thrombectomy versus thrombectomy with two, two different groupings. So you're not really comparing it to standard medical therapy, which some of these patients may be the only thing they qualify for based on our current guidelines. There's another prospective study from running from six years uh, to two centers comparing patients with an MRS of zero to one with patients uh, from two to three. So some degree of pre-stroke disability. And when this was um, adjusted based on things like patient age, their uh, glucose upon uh, like hospitalization or their fasting glucose, their NIH stroke scale based on the presentation, their time to recannulization, their NIH stroke scale, there was really no uh, increased or significant change in the, the odds of returning to your pre-stroke disability between patients who had essentially pre-stroke or returning to your, your same MRS with patients with pre-stroke disability as compared to patients without it. And within this cohort of patients, of those with a pre-stroke MRS of three, around 30 plus percent of them returned to that same degree of disability, which are patients who are walking. They're walking out of the hospital. Within this prospective cohort as well, there was no difference in the rate of recannulization or good recannulization in the mid 80s. There was no change in the uh, length, significant difference in the median length of hospitalization. There was no uh, difference in the rate of symptomatic hemorrhage within these patients. And again, no significant difference in the rate of uh, 90 day disability as compared to their pre stroke MRS. Now, patients with uh, more disability did have an increased risk of mortality, even when you adjust for some of those things. But as you can see through the procedure itself, we may be keeping more of these patients where they were before or walking out similar to how they looked before, which may improve their quality of life, improve the value of our overall care, the cost that stroke has on the medical system as well. And less of these patients may end up in facilities um, away from their families. Again, this is a busy slide and I apologize. This is a forest plot. So essentially Yang et al. did a, a meta-analysis of 13 different observational studies, the a risk of bias assessment. Again, looking at some of these questions and this first graphic is looking at the rate um, in comparison of patients with MRS of two, three, or four, their rate of um, return to their baseline modified rank and scale. So their baseline disability as compared to those without it and their mortality. And interestingly enough, as you increase your modified Rankin scale with thrombectomy, you have a higher likelihood of returning to your baseline MRS. And that actually makes sense if you think about the modified Rankin scale as a nonlinear function. You know, a zero is easy to understand. You have no symptoms, but there's a wide variance in what a three means or a four means and why you can't walk, what is hampering you from doing your day-to-day -day life, things like osteoarthritis, which may impact your mobility more so than, you know, uh, post-stroke spasticity, something like that. With increasing uh, disability, patients did have an increased risk of mortality as compared to patients without but in looking at three different studies where they actually compared this to standard medical therapy in patients with pre-stroke disability, patients with endovascular thrombectomy had a higher likelihood of returning to their baseline functional status, as well as a lower likelihood of mortality at three months as compared to standard medical therapy. Uh, so there's potentially power in this procedure, again, to improve their outcomes, lower care costs, um, and improve mortality looking at their rate of reperfusion. So this is going off Tiki score. So a Tiki three essentially is when you do the procedure and pull out the clot, you have complete reperfusion. 2B is near complete reperfusion. Um, Tiki zero to 2A, um, zero being none, um, 2A being less than 50% essentially. If you're good at doing this procedure, if you can get complete reperfusion, your likelihood of getting back uh, to your pre-stroke modified Rankin scale, your degree of pre-stroke disability is quite good. 
and you're reducing mortality if you can do that. And going back to our prior study, our ability to achieve complete recannulization, at least in this population, though there may be some selection bias in all of these populations, was similar to patients without post-stroke disability or without pre-stroke disability. So if you're able to anatomically get there and you can successfully do these procedures, these patients may have considerable benefit. Now, there hasn't been a randomized clinical trial on this. There's actually going to be a platform trial for endovascular thrombectomy where they're going to try to answer this question and how they define the outcome will be interesting. Um, but the main conclusion here is that we shouldn't just exclude patients who have disability from powerful procedures like endovascular thrombectomy on the surface. Guidelines are meant to be followed, but we have to think beyond the guidelines and think forward as well. And a number of these patients may significantly benefit and at least deserve the conversation of their overall risks in thinking about these procedures and what they may want or what may be an acceptable outcome for them. Because if we're just blindly giving them aspirin and statin and putting them in a facility to die in 90 days, I don't think that's ethically right uh, to withhold these procedures. The other challenge of this, as I said, is our intra-observer reliability, at least in the acute stroke setting, varies quite widely. So we may be missing patients who we can actually do these procedures on just based on how we're defining pre-stroke disability, which is in regard to the MRS misses a lot of comorbid illness or why they may be there in the first place, things like frailty and their true ability uh, to complete these tasks. And as we've seen, some of these current observations um, may suggest improved clinical outcomes. And I'll kind of finish with this. I'm not going to do a talk without a clear stroke analogy. So what you're seeing here within the backdrop is kind of shot charts in the NBA from the late 1990s. And I should mention with this trivia question, I, I was born in 1992. So most of my sports watching is like the mid late nineties up to now, up to the 2020 season, essentially. And you can see the wide change. And where we're seeing in 2020 is a number of players who are shooting things like threes or spacing the floor, where we weren't doing this before. Shots that were thought to be dangerous. Even the early 2000s Celtics who were jacking up a ton of threes, they were thought to be crazy. And now look at where the NBA is through things like data analytics. Players who were thought to not have value have immense value to teams in expanding our offense. Things like stroke through data, our new interventions like thrombectomy have our ability to combat stroke early on better than we've ever seen before. No longer are patients sitting in the corner on a heparin drip. They have, we have the ability to intervene and we're, we're growing in our ability to intervene and improve our offensive efficiency against things like stroke through the means of endovascular thrombectomy, delayed window thrombolysis, large core thrombectomy, um, new uh, developments of, of thrombolytics and an ability to recover from stroke. For those who are considering what they're gonna do with their next career step, it's a really exciting time to go into the stroke world and especially work on some of these interventions that may impact our ability to provide significant, significantly improved quality of life and quality of care uh, to these patients. So um, I'm really excited to, to contribute to some of that and continue to watch kind of the evolution of, of basketball and the stroke world uh, hand in hand. Um, with that, I, I won't read everything, but uh, just thank you to the, the program for for allowing me to come back to Duke after uh, I was a trader for a, a bit in a, in a different basketball world, as well as my research mentors, um, Dr. Morganlander and Dr. O'Brien for talking through uh, my insanity uh, over my favorite teams, uh, Gina for putting up with uh, my lateness with elective forms and a number of different things, um, and especially my co-residents and, and my class who uh, have really inspired me to work hard be a better person, uh, advocate for patients. Um, and, and I can't say enough how, how thankful I have been to go through uh, this process with them uh, and be able to, to give opportunities to do, uh, do talks and horrible stand-up uh, during a noon conference. Uh, lastly, uh, I'd like to thank my wonderful wife, Lee. Um, there's us, it's my favorite picture over the, the Boston Harbor there. Um, but she really is the glue that holds everything together, um, who gets me to log off at home uh, when I wanna know somebody's 
outcome or something at the hospital um, and who puts up with all my kind of intricacies uh, and curiosities at home. Uh, even a, a nice Tom Brady groom's cake there uh, before our wedding. Um, my wonderful family and our, our two dogs. Uh, yes, uh, that's Skittles on the right, who does have a sweater and a jersey. Uh, and Rocky was helping Lee with her uh, gardening. Those are my references, and I'm happy to take questions. And I'll I can look if anybody got the answer. <laughs> well, that was uh, very thoughtful, and I think incredibly important. Uh, let me see. How do I make this stop? There we go. So anyone in the interworld uh, can just put themselves in the chat. Where's the somebody, chat? Somebody, somebody won the question. Okay, you want to announce it? Yeah. Um, so I'll find Tom later, uh, but Tom has won. So a lot of people thought it would be Tom Brady. Uh, no, he, he left. So that was sad when he left, but the retirement was coming. So the, the one answer, um, and it's funny that Tom gets this because it was against Cleveland, uh, was David Ortiz. So this was 2016. They lost in the playoffs. Ortiz like meant everything to the city after the bombing and, and bringing the World Series. Not that I'm going to hamper and kill time, uh, but when 25,000 people stay at Fenway until you come out to the mound and he started crying uh, at home, I started tearing up because just of everything he meant to the, the city itself. So uh, I will have a prize for Tom. I'll find him in the console room. All right, so, uh, and it took me back down memory lane. The idea of a patient with a stroke on a heparin drip in the corner really spoke to me and probably Joel too. Joel, you have the first question. So no one, it's interesting you picked patients that had aphasia, which had nothing to do with the MRS. So to me, like, I, I, when you talk about these patients with more disability mm -hmm. like, making these decisions, like the crucial thing that must come up, which I'm not sure I saw you present, is these patients with higher baseline disability in general. Are more <laughs> yeah. What is their risk of the procedure up front? Because if you give me a year without aphasia, like I'd rather not have aphasia yeah. than to embarrass this. Like I can live in a wheelchair, but not being able to communicate with people is yeah. huge, right? So what what is the upfront risk to these patients with more disability? Just what you so the, the question essentially was going back to the initial cases saying, you know, my invented cases looked at things like aphasia, which may be a a uh, like a, a different question that isn't included in the MRS itself and may uh, change your discussion and looking at the uh, upfront risk of things like uh, endovascular thrombectomy or their procedure itself in patients who may be more frail or have a higher dis de degree of disability based on some of their other kind of comorbid conditions. And I don't have an exact number for you um, other than it seems through at least the number of observational studies looking at some of this um, and some of the interventionalists will probably uh, know better than I, um, that they, as compared to patients without disability have significantly increased mortality that even when you adjust just for some baseline patient characteristics that seems to carry over. Um, but I, I don't know what that exact number is other than as you increase that degree of say inability to walk, or inability to perform your kind of daily ADLs just from a physical standpoint, um, the procedure gets more complicated or you may have a, a, a higher risk of a worse outcome. Uh, David Hassan. Oh yeah, thanks guys. Um, this was really an excellent talk and I wish um, we kind of used your talk when we wrote the grant. Uh, I would just want to add a few comments. One, um, there is an actually approved uh, prospective um, uh, efficacy study um, by PCORI, led by Jeff Savory and his uh, team to look at um, mechanical thrombectomy and uh, pre-morbid, I mean pre-stroke uh, disability. That this one is all inclusive for anything MRS greater than or equal, I mean greater than or equal to three, but less than five. So it's involved about 13 centers and they're, they're in the process of moving forward with it. Probably some of you know that Wayne and I, we submitted a grant 
uh, five center, actually six center trial. It's a randomized trial to look at uh, dementia uh, and mechanical thrombectomy in this cohort. We submitted in the first submission, we got um, a score of 25 percentile and should be in sub uh, awarded, but the council, the NIA council at the end said no and pushed us to the NIMBS for the platform. That was heartbreaking. So we're waiting for the step to, to go through that and do this. Now, um, there's something probably needing that with patient with dementia that when you do mechanical thrombectomy, now whether it's a true or not, but in observation, there are a much higher, a higher, at least the observation suggests there are significantly higher risk of intraparenchymal hemorrhage after the mechanical thrombectomy. Yeah. So that's that's that uh, the hesitation from uh, a lot of the uh, interventionists in addition to the bias because they were excluded before and they don't know the benefits. So that's there. Uh, Wayne and I suggested in our uh, trial to look at EPLI E4 as possibility, um, as um, a factor for increased uh, hemorrhage in these patients. So that's that's need to be taken into consideration when you um, when you do the mechanical thrombectomy in these patients. Um, we did suggest as a primary endpoint, which is completely uh, different than than others. We're not looking at uh, improving this patient because you cannot improve them. Yep. What we suggested is MRS uh, five or six as primary endpoint. So we we suggested that if you do mechanical thrombectomy, you prevent these patients from going into MRS five and six. So hopefully maintaining their status, if you will. And that was perceived as innovative by the reviewers. Um, the issue, the main critique by the stroke neurologist um, who reviewed the grant, and all of them are known, and we've got names, they all, uh, the three of them, which kind of weighted heavily on the council and reviewed, which is, again, the numbers, and all the stroke neurologists, not the, the interventionists, that reviewed it, they say the trial is not significant and at high risk for these patients and is unethical. So uh, that was, that was um, unfortunately, um, I, I, again, we, I, without naming the people, they're well-known stroke neurologists who reviewed and they were on the list. They're, that's their comment, it's insignificant, unethical. And that's exactly what the NIA council came to us and said, David, we would funded you if it wasn't for these two comments. So that's, I'll leave it there. So, and I would just throw in now with lacanumab, it's an even bigger issue. So, yeah. uh, agreed. So, uh, I think we had some more on the internet. Uh, Daniel Parker, do you want to speak for the dementia world? I saw you had your hand up. Uh, that must have been an accident because I don't have any comments. Because it's just so great. Any, yeah. any, one last question in the room? Has a question. Okay, Marvin, take it away. I, I can yeah, can you hear me? Yeah. Yep. When you talk about cost of treatment, that gets kind of squishy. Yeah. And I noticed that a lot of your slides, they spell favor with a U. So clearly, those weren't done on the North American continent. I don't yeah, think. they're they're done in the UK. Yeah, so right. talking about and like so, governmental cost. Yeah. So the who who pays for the for these treatments? That probably makes a difference. Yes. Uh, the VA is different. Duke yep. is different. Yep. Uh, some people come in and they pay everything out of pocket. Uh, that's a that's that's a problem, and it may influence what kind of treatments the patients get. I completely agree, um, which not getting into some of that, at least in the US, um, is an unfortunate aspect that comes up with care with somebody's insurance or their ability to pay uh, for a treatment that may be beneficial, uh, may impact their overall outcome, uh, which eventually uh, we may get to a system where more of this is thought to be the value of cost for like a, a universal payer. Um, but yes, I, I agree, at least here, um, there's a, a challenges in determining who those costs or what that value is uh, to the patient as compared to what they may pay or what their insurer, or insurer may pay for. Thank you. That's a great talk. 
Thanks. Um, so um, uh, thank you all for coming. Thank you for that really thoughtful talk. Um, I, I think it's a nice niche to start carving out. And uh, everyone else, uh, have a great 4th of July and uh, uh, enjoy the day. <laughs>